Good evening all, and welcome. Tonight, we're going to be talking about some people who I'm sure you'd rather not meet. So I hope you're ready, because it's time to get comfortable and let the darkness take control. This took place in Berwick, Maine. It was December 20th of the year 1993, though it didn't come to a complete end until the 21st or 22nd. It's all a bit hazy for me. I was 14 years old, and my dad was no longer in our lives. For reasons I'm not going to get into right now, another experience I will share at a later time. Before you walk into the apartment, you had to go through a door and step into a little room that had stairs to the left of the apartment. Now when you walk into the apartment, you start in the living room, go straight and you're in the kitchen. To the left, up one step, you're in the bathroom. In the kitchen, through the doorway, you're in my brother's room. Through there, go through another doorway, and there would be my room. In my room, there was a door on the left to the exit of the back of the apartment. I remember we were on Christmas vacation for school. It had snowed pretty heavy that day, and we had just finished having a birthday for my brother. So it was my mother, three brothers, and the next door neighbor's son. His name was Johnny. Johnny just so happened to be the same age as me. Him and I went to the same school as well, and he had a crush on me. I remember all of us children were in my brother's room. We were working on a puzzle and had a question for my mum. My mum was sitting in the living room on the couch, and I should also add, there was a window above the kitchen sink. This is important. So I walked out of my brother's room and into the kitchen. Passing the window, I was talking to my mother when I heard a strange sound, but paid it no mind. I asked my question, and was walking back to my brother's room, when I heard the same sound again. I turned around looking at my mother, asking if she'd heard that. She responded in the affirmative, and I told her I heard the same sound when walking in there for the first time. So out of stupid curiosity, I wanted to see if it would happen again, if I passed the window. I know, I know. Completely idiotic thing to do. Please bear in mind, I was a dumb 14 year old. So I pass the kitchen window again, and yet again we hear the sound. I asked my mum what it was, and she said it was probably a bunch of kids playing around with firecrackers. My mum had asked me what I thought it sounded like. I told her that I didn't know. Now our apartment was the last one on the right facing the apartment complex. It wasn't a normal apartment complex, it looked more like a long two-story house. If anyone from New England is listening, you all know what I'm talking about. There was a garage right next to us, though the building was further back than a house after that. So after my mom saying that, I just shrugged my shoulders. I said okay, and walked back to my brother's room. Again, I heard the same sound this time, but it was several at once, like they had lit several firecrackers. I turned and looked at my mum again, and said, yeah, that kind of sounds more like a gun. I asked her if she still thought it was firecrackers. She said that it was going way too far. She goes over to her friend's apartment to call the police, and I begged her not to go, as I was starting to get very scared at this point. She told me not to worry, and that it would be fine. She told me to lock the door behind her, and under no circumstances to answer the door for anyone other than herself. I asked her how exactly I was supposed to know that it was her. She told me that she would knock twice, and that's how we would know. She ran out, and I locked the door. At this point, my brother and Johnny knew something was wrong. My brother started asking me a bunch of questions with a terrified look on his face. Johnny asked me what I thought it sounded like, and I said I wasn't sure. 
I told Johnny and my brothers to crawl into the kitchen and get into the bathroom now. I crawled and grabbed my little brother, who was only one at the time. We all huddled in the bathroom, and I shut the door, locking it. I figured we would be safer in the bathroom, because there was a small window in there. I knew an adult wouldn't fit through it, but we could. The bathroom window led to the back of the building, so if we needed to escape, we could. Plus, there was an extra wall to shield us from the bullets, if that's what it was. Now mind you, all of this happened in less than a minute, and then I heard several going off at once, and I was starting to think that they weren't what my mother said they were. My heart sunk into the pit of my stomach at the thought. My mum was out there, and someone could possibly be shooting her. If so, was she still alive, or was she dead? The boys started crying, and I told them to calm down, please, and to be as quiet as possible. My heart was beating rapidly, my body shaking all over. I wanted to completely freak out, but I knew I couldn't for my brother's sake. I handed my little brother to Johnny, and told him to keep my brothers in the bathroom while I checked on my mum. I crawled through the kitchen one more time, and ran into the living room. The windows to the living room were on the front of the building, and not on the side. There were no windows on the side of the living room, so I cautiously peeked out the window, and I couldn't see my mother anywhere. I breathed a sigh of relief, and thought to myself I was overreacting. I was heading back to the bathroom, when I heard a knock at the door. I was terrified, and my heart felt like it was going to beat out of my chest. I froze in fear. Johnny looked at me, and I mouthed, what do I do? I didn't answer or say anything. Then I heard knocking again. I knew it wasn't my mum, and Johnny crawled into the living room and stood beside me. Johnny finally asked, who is it? And a deep male voice replied, it's me. Johnny and I looked at each other. Johnny said, yo, who the hell is me? The voice on the other side said, It's me, Kevin. Johnny said, Oh, it's okay. That's my stepdad. I said okay. And Johnny opened the door and asked Kevin if he heard what we heard. He then asked, What do you guys think it sounded like? I start thinking to myself, Why are all these adults asking us children what it sounded like? Johnny and I both said that we weren't sure. Still being worried about my mum, I asked Kevin if he'd seen her. He said no, and I said okay. And he told us to come and stay at their place until my mother got back. So I went and got the boys, and we headed towards the door. When I noticed Bear standing in the street. Bear was my mum's friend. I looked at Johnny, and asked him if he could watch my brothers right quick. He said sure, no problem. And I thought to myself... Well, he's out in the street, so it's safe. Little did I know how wrong I was. What happened next still gives me nightmares to this day. It happened so quickly. So I ran towards Bear, giving him a hug once getting to him. I asked him if he'd seen my mum. He said yeah, that she was on the phone with the police right now. I was so relieved. And after hugging him, I stepped back, standing to the left of him. I noticed Bear was looking at the house that was close to the garage I told you about. I followed his eyes looking at the house, myself, and then back at him. Then all of a sudden, I heard the sound again, though this time, I heard this ringing or winding sound, and my hair moved slightly close to my left ear. Bear grabbed my right arm. I was looking at Bear. He now had a worried look on his face. Then I heard the sound again, and then blood splattered all over me. Bear had been shot in the face, left cheek to be exact. He screamed out in pain, telling me to run, to run for cover, and to get out of there. I ran, bursting through Johnny's door, blood all over me, shaking and crying. I felt my knees wanting to collapse. 
I'm asthmatic, so I began hyperventilating. That's when I met Wendy, who would become my best friend for years to come. This was the first time I ever met her. She was on the phone in our kitchen. She looked at me and said, who are you? And I said, I'm your next door neighbor. I then told her the bear was shot in the face. She said, what? And I screamed at her that bear had just been shot in the face. Wendy said I had to go and got off the phone. At this point, her parents came into the living room. I'm not gonna lie. My memory is a little hazy at this point. I just watched a man get shot in the face for crying out loud, and his blood is all over me. I remember crying, and then nothing. I think I was in shock at this point. Wendy's mom noticed the blood on me, and she told Wendy to take me upstairs and get me some different clothes to put on. Wendy tried talking to me, but I don't remember what I said. I don't remember how or when my mother got to the house. I remember that we all piled into their small bathroom. There was a door in there that led to an open basement, and it went the whole length of the apartment. In our apartment, it was the living room. My brothers were sitting in the tub. My brother, whose birthday it was, puked in the tub. It smelled horrible. I was sitting on the toilet rocking back and forth, and was hyperventilating again. I remember the ambulance was trying to get me but couldn't. The shooter was shooting at everything that moved. So as I was sitting there rocking back and forth looking at the mirror, something strange happened. I saw a man in it. He was an older man, maybe in his forties. He was kind of heavy set. His hair was to his ears, not really kept up messy it seemed. Brown eyes I think, and he had stubble on his face, like he hadn't shaved in days blue shirt, with a pocket on the left, and blue jeans. I remember we were in that bathroom for hours. The police kept calling us. That's how my mother found out that the ambulance wasn't going to be able to get to me. But they did get Bear, and he was alive, but in critical condition. In some aspects that made me feel so much better and calmed me down, because I didn't know if he was going to survive getting shot. I don't remember how many hours we were in there for. It was quiet, and then all of a sudden the back door was knocked down. It scared the hell out of everyone. It was the SWAT team, a bunch of men in all black with gas masks on. It was a scary sight to see, but I felt safe. Finally, for once out of all of this ordeal, I felt genuinely safe. They had us exit the back of the building. The funny thing is it was my bedroom that gave us cover, due to the way it was built. We quietly snuck to the other side of the apartment, and the man started shooting again. So we were stuck there for hours. It seemed like forever. It was freezing cold, and the cops were nice enough to give us blankets, jackets, gloves, hats, food, and something warm to drink. At some point the sun began to rise. You have to understand I have no concept of time anymore. I remember it being dark at some point, and then light at another. It was almost like my mind checked out, like I was in and out of consciousness. Perhaps it was my mind's way of trying to cope and deal with the situation. On a funny note, we had a skunk visit us. Then something happened. See, we lived right next to Summerworth, New Hampshire. The borderline bridge was in walking distance from the apartment. Across the river was a laundromat. There was a tree on the other side behind the laundromat in the banking. I heard shooting again, but this time it sounded like a rifle. I watched that tree smash to pieces, like parts of it just disintegrated, gone. I froze in fear. Did I really just see that? I couldn't believe my eyes. My heart started pounding out my chest. I started shaking again. I thought to myself, how many different guns did he have? My brothers started crying again. My poor brothers. I knew how they felt. They were cold, scared, hungry and tired, and just wanted this nightmare to be over. Especially my one-year-old brother. I remember taking him from my mum, and wrapping him up in all the blankets we had and kept him close to my chest. 
I whispered in his ear that it was going to be okay, and that he was going to be safe, and that Mum and I and all the police officers would never let anything happen to him. And I quietly sang to him his favourite song, Immortal Babe. See, there's a 13-year-old difference between him and I. Since the day he was born, I've always sang him that song. And it always either puts him to sleep or made him stop crying. At some point, which I don't remember how long it was, the police told us that they were getting ready to move all of us to the town hall, which wasn't that far from the apartment either. They told us to go behind the vehicle in front of the other apartment where Bear lived, and my mother was listening to the police. One of them said that when they say to go, to go as quickly as we can. The police gathered around us and waited for the signal, and we started towards the vehicles and all hell broke loose. He started shooting at us again. The cops fired their guns, and I remember hearing bullets hit the vehicles, and one of the tires going flat. The other police officers guiding us to town hall, and I ran and ran. As we got closer to the street, I noticed the roads blocked off, and people and news crews were standing all around. And because I had a blanket in my arms that was bigger than me because I was only four feet tall, looking at all the people, I wasn't paying attention, and I tripped on the blanket and fell to the ground. I remember hearing people scream in terror. Maybe they thought I got shot. I didn't get up right away. I'd hit my head pretty hard on the ground, and I was rattled and confused there for a few seconds. And I was so humiliated and embarrassed to fall in front of so many people. And I'm pretty sure they caught it on camera or video. I remember a police officer picking me up and running with me. I mean, a bunch of guns were being fired, bullets flying everywhere. It was scary. I was terrified. I looked around to see if all my family had made it safely there, and they did. Thank goodness. The police hurried us closer to the town hall building. Then, news people were coming up to us, asking us what had happened. They were talking to my mother. She was holding my sleeping little brother in her arms. I remember taking him out of her arms, holding him close to me. Another friend of my mother's took him for me. While newspapers were talking to my mother and me, there were tons of them. They were talking to everyone. We eventually went to the building. It seemed to be complete chaos. There were police and people everywhere. Police were talking about plans to end the situation. They had blueprints of the building. Medical people started checking us out. And I remember this one guy who I didn't know who he was, but he was of power and importance. With his clean cut gray hair and a gray mustache and a full round face. Full bodied in a nice three piece suit and black shoes. He asked if we were okay, and that they were going to get the situation taken care of as soon as possible, and that we were now safe, and if we needed anything to not hesitate to ask. It was a huge relief to be there. I was able to finally breathe. People asked if we were hungry, and I said yes. They were talking about going somewhere to eat to get real food. I said yes please. They were asking us what we would like, and I said pizza, and I believe that's what they got. They put us in an auditorium, and Wendy and I did gymnastics for a while. We ate, talked, and eventually settled down, and I laid down and finally went to sleep. I slept on and off, and kept on waking up every time I would hear a gun being fired. At some point, I finally managed to enter a deep slumber. It was quiet, and I was awoken with a bunch of guns fired and a pause, and then more guns, and then silence. I'll never forget the feelings I felt. An array of mixed feelings. Sadness, because I knew what it meant. It meant that a life had ultimately been taken. But at the same time, I couldn't help but be happy, because I knew this whole nightmarish ordeal was over. I quietly cried for a few minutes, then fell back asleep. I remember a nightmare had me wake up, and I got up, and we eventually went back home. 
I remember when I walked into our apartment, and there was a heaviness in the air. The feeling in the apartment felt off. It felt menacing, and almost evil. Very negative. It didn't feel safe anymore. The feeling in the apartment never dissipated, and we never felt safe there again. I went into my room, and got pissed. My bedroom was trashed. The cops knocked the door right off the hedges, ripped my curtains and the curtain rod out the wall. My mattress was turned over. The door never shut the same way again even after it was fixed. And I later found out that my room was used as a stakeout. Bear made a complete recovery. The bullet went into his left cheek and lodged itself into his neck. From what I hear, it's still in there because he refused to shave his beard off. Well, back when he was a biker. Many years later, I found out he wasn't well. He was never the same after the shooting, though who the hell would be honestly? I know I'm not, and haven't been since. And remember the man I saw in the mirror? Well, I described him to Wendy a couple of days after the shooting, which she later told me, described the shooter to a T. Funny thing is, I don't recall ever seeing him, but perhaps I did. To be honest with you, I can't remember his photo in the newspaper. That's how Wendy knew what he looked like. I just can't remember even to this day. All of us kids went back to school after Christmas vacation, but we couldn't deal with it. Kids were coming up to me and asking me a bunch of questions. They wouldn't leave me alone. I went to the office and asked to call my mother, and that I needed to leave. The school understood. They told me to take as much time off as need be. And when I went to leave, the school news crews were there bombing me with a bunch of questions and cameras in my face. People were taking pictures of me. And I felt very unsafe. I couldn't handle it. And we took a leave of absence for several months. We also found out that they threw tear gas in his home. Several times, I guess. But he never came out. And now the police know why. He walked out of his door wearing a gas mask, shooting at the police. It took two clips from each officer before he ultimately lost his life. Afterwards, they went into his home and were horrified. They had found different types of medication. He had an arsenal of guns of all different types. He had dug an underground tunnel from his house to his shed to reload his guns. There was a bunch of ammunition in the shed. The cops also informed me that the swooshing sound and my hair moving was a bullet. They told me had I moved my head any more, he would have shot me in the head. Dead. They told me I was very lucky to still be alive. The shooter was in fact my neighbour. His name was Patrick Wood. He was ex-military. Makes sense why he was able to evade the police for so long. His wife had left him, taking her son and daughter with her. Then he found out he was terminally ill with cancer. That would explain the different types of medication. With all of that taking place, I can't help but think this is the reason why he snapped. I mean, it would be a good reason for someone to go off the deep end. Now I want to make this perfectly clear right now. I pass no judgement on his wife, nor do I blame her or anyone else for the matter of his actions. Those were his actions alone. I'm sure she has good reason for why she left and taken her kids too. I actually went to school with their daughter, and I know everyone is going to think I'm crazy for what I'm about to say, but don't misinterpret what I'm going to say. Just hear me out. I can't help but feel bad for him in some ways. I feel sorry for him. I mean, humour me for a minute, will you? Close your eyes. Put yourself in his shoes. Your wife and kids are gone. You're still living in this house filled with years of memories. Then you go to the doctor and find out you're dying from cancer? You drive back home to find an empty house. You're just sitting there with your own thoughts and emotions. You're sad. Angry. Feeling pure hate, rage and pissed off at God and the whole world and you're all alone. Now imagine that was you. You can open your eyes. So now you know what he was feeling before he decided to do this horrific act. And he knew he was never coming back. I know, I know. 
How could I ever feel this way towards the man that came so close to possibly killing me? It's simple, really. Because I put myself in his shoes. I now understand what led him to do this horrific act that permanently affected my family and all the people around me. Though I myself, personally, would never do what he did. I would have dealt with it differently. But honestly, deep down, I feel like if he wanted me dead, he could have killed me when he had the chance to. But for some reason which I can't explain, he didn't. Maybe he saw his daughter in me. We are around the same age. And that's why he decided to spare my life. Because we weren't that far away from him. I mean, come on. He shot Bear right in the face. He's ex-military. He knows how to aim the target and terminate. He could have killed both of us. But he didn't. So it leads me to believe he wasn't as bad a person as the people made him out to me. Because no one lost their lives in that shooting other than him. And that is saddening. It is to me. Maybe if someone had been there to help him. Or if he got the professional help he needed. Maybe this would have never happened. And his life wouldn't have ended in such a brutal manner. Don't think I excuse what he did. Because there's no excuse for it. What he did was wrong on every level. Morally, it was wrong. Over the years, I have since forgiven him, but I've never forgotten what he did. While writing this, it dawned on me the anniversary of the shooting is coming up next month. I always get nervous around Christmas. This experience has changed mine and so many others' lives forever. I always thought shootings only happened in movies, but I learnt this is not the case. This experience has left me never feeling safe no matter where I go. It's caused me to never feel safe at home. I think people have a false sense of security whenever they think they're safe in their homes. It made my insomnia worsen. It made me into an introvert. I'm a homebody, and I don't really leave my home at all. Only if I have to. And even then, my anxiety is horrible. I start to have major panic attacks, cold sweats, heart racing, laboured breath, feelings of nausea, and feel like I'm going to pass out. I always look over my shoulder, watching people, being aware of my surroundings. I don't trust people at all. Though I had trust issues before this. But it didn't help in the slightest. It's caused my PTSD to worsen. I'm always on guard, in defence mode, and I've had several years of therapy. It hasn't helped with everything. Though some of this has helped me with other traumatic events that have taken place in my life. I messed up. I'm a mentally broken person because of this event, along with the string of traumatic events that followed. But in some sick and twisted way, it also made me a stronger person for it. It made me the person I am now, which, if I'm going to be honest with you all, and myself, I can't say it's all a good thing, because it's not. It is what it is. I know I'm the only one who can change it. I'm more resilient, adapt to any environment or situation quickly and easily, more perspective and initiative. I'm a fighter. I don't take crap from people anymore and I'm extremely protective of those I love. Though people wouldn't know it by looking at me, that I've been through a lot, I seem pretty normal on the outside, and that's because I've gotten really good at not showing on the outside. You can't show fear to people, because some people will see you as prey, so people won't ever see what's going on on the inside. I prefer to keep it that way, to be honest. I have to admit, I've never written or spoken about this, it's been rather nerve-wracking, and has put me on edge. I mean, I vaguely have talked about it, but in therapy, but that was years ago. It's brought up a lot of feelings to the surface again, that I don't like. I tend to keep these feelings buried deep down, and that is exactly what I am going to do again. This story takes place in the 80s, when I was about 7 or 8 years old. I'm a 37-year-old woman now, 
but I still think I carry some trauma from this particular incident. At the time, my parents had just purchased an old fixer-upper for cheap that needed to be totally renovated inside in order to bring it up to code and make it habitable. In the interim, they found a cheap place to live which just so happened to be in a mobile home park. Back then, it was a fairly well-kept place that consisted mainly of the elderly and a few younger families that were just starting out. I recently revisited the place just to see what it looked like now, and it's basically turned into a white trash drug den. It's really sad, but I digress. We'd been living there for a while when the older couple that lived next to us decided to move out of state to live closer to family. Their mobile home sat vacant for about a month before a younger couple with two small children moved in. The first thing my friend Joey, who was the only other kid in the neighborhood my age, and myself, noticed was how weird the oldest daughter was. She was younger than us, probably only three or four, but she was spooky. Her parents would let her sit in the window naked and stare at us while we were playing outside. She'd sit there with her face and hands pressed up against the glass and just stare. When she would come outside dressed, she'd wander over the edge of our driveway and stare at us from there. I can't remember ever hearing her speak, and if we spoke to her, she'd run home. AKA, she was really weird. The patriarch of the family, the psychopathic meth head, who we will call PMH for short, had an apparent visceral dislike for anything resembling a feline. It's important to note here that we lived in an area with a lot of feral cats and pet cats that would roam around outside. Many of the elderly in the community loved to feed and care for the cats, so they weren't really that afraid of people. We had our own indoor cat, Princess, and had more or less adopted two strays that had taken to hanging around our yard. Mum was feral, long-haired and grey, and a white female. My friend and I named her Kitty. Kitty was just becoming trusting enough that she'd let you get close enough to touch her, which makes this story even more upsetting in my opinion. The other cat was large, a black tomcat that everyone called Toby. Toby was rough looking, blind in one eye and completely missing an ear. But it was obvious that he'd been someone's pet in the past, because he was a complete snuggle bug and absolutely loved to be petted. I loved that old cat. The first incident started when we started noticing that people were leaving little paper cups filled with wet cat food in our yard. This irritated my dad because he was a landscaper by trade and kept a neat yard. So whenever he'd see them, he'd chuck them in the trash. A couple of weeks after these cups started appearing, my mum was speaking to one of our neighbours, and she told my mum that she'd found one of her cats curled up under her steps, dead, and the other one was very sick. At the time, we didn't put two and two together. Approximately a week following the conversation, I was taking some food out of the patio for the cats. Toby came running as always, but Kitty was nowhere to be seen. I knew that she liked to sun herself on our back steps, so I took off around the house to see if she was there. I found her in the grass next to the steps, covered in vomit, with foam coming out of her mouth and nose. I ran inside and called my mum and dad, and they came out and picked her up, and I remember thinking she looked like a rag doll just flopping around in his hands. Next to our steps, you guessed it, a little paper cup filled with cat food. My dad picked it up and smelt it. Antifreeze. Kitty was alive just barely, and so had my mum call poison control. After funnel feeding her, activated charcoal, as per their instructions, Kitty died on the way to the emergency vet. A neighbour who'd been outside when all this drama had gone down, later told my dad that he'd seen the psycho meth head placing those little cups of cat food around the neighbourhood and that he hadn't thought much of it, because everyone fed the cats. My dad called the police, but since this was the 80s, they didn't do much besides to tell him to stop putting out poison. After that, PMH pretty much had it in for us. 
He'd scream at my friend and I whenever we were outside, even if we were playing on the sidewalk or the street. He'd scream at us to get off his property, despite the fact that we weren't on it. Someone broke my swing set by snapping the swing seats in half. Air was let out of the tyres on my mum's car, and someone was dumping a bunch of nails and screws in our driveway. Garbage was thrown in our yard, eggs thrown in our windows, and they started playing loud music at all hours of the day and night. It was ridiculous. Police were called by other neighbours numerous times due to the noise, but it didn't seem to deter him. The most frightening episode happened a couple of months after Kitty died. My dad had a flatbed pickup truck that Joey and I liked to play in. I remember that this particular day, we were pretending that the back of the truck was a pirate ship. Toby was wandering around in the driveway, and we were pretending that he was a shark. I'd just yell something like, ah, oh, shark, and Joey was pretending to shoot at Toby with a cannon. When out of nowhere, PMH comes running around the side of his house with a shovel raised over his head. I only had time to register Joey yelling, I remember this so vividly that it still makes me sick to my stomach. He hit Toby square in the back, and I heard a crack, and his back legs went out, and I still wasn't sure if it was me, Joey, or Toby, but someone was screaming. Toby was trying to drag himself away, and PMH raised the shovel again and brought it back down. There was blood, and I'm fairly certain I saw one of Toby's eye sockets pop out. Joey and I were both screaming and crying by this time, which had drawn the attention of our parents as well as some of our neighbours. Joey's mum called the police, and my dad confronted him. I didn't see what happened after that, because my mum took both me and Joey inside and tried to calm us down, but later learnt that PMH threatened my dad with the shovel, and they got into a physical altercation that ended with my dad punching the guy in the face and taking the shovel so he couldn't hurt anyone. The police showed up and arrested PMH, who was apparently high as a kite on something, and he ended up being charged with possession. I think unfortunately back then, animal cruelty laws were a complete joke. Thankfully, not long after, our house was complete enough that we could move, and I didn't have to see him anymore. Not too long ago, I learned that he had been busted for making and distributing meth. I can't say I'm surprised. Once a psychotic loser, always a psychotic loser. I have two stories to share. Okay, for reference, I am a 22-year-old female living in South Africa. South Africa is a beautiful country, but unfortunately, it's not all that safe. You cannot safely walk on the streets or take public transportation. My story begins when I was 15, and I wanted to get some new clothes. My mum dropped me off at a shopping centre close to my house. I walked around, feeling so cool to be shopping by myself. As I'm walking, there was a man sitting on a bench wearing blue overalls, looking like he was a construction worker, and about his mid-thirties. As I walked past him, he whistled at me and said, Hey, sexy! And I was really creeped out and didn't respond and just kept walking. I looked over my shoulder and saw that he was now walking behind me. He yelled out again. Hey, beautiful! Keep in mind I was a 15-year-old girl, and this guy was double my age. When he looked at me, it wasn't friendly, or as if he was joking. He gazed at me like I was a piece of meat, and he had malicious intentions. At this point I was scared and didn't know what to do. In the moment, I ran around the corner and hid in the nearest store. Once I was in the store, I went back and called my mum, asking her to please fetch me out of there as soon as possible, because the creepy man was following me. This incident happened last week, when I was going to fetch my friend for varsity. My friend May goes to the same varsity as me, and only lives 10 minutes away from my place. We only became friends in April this year because she's an idiot and was in the wrong class for most of the first semester. I even remember when my class wrote on one of our first tests that my friend Tasha turned to me and said, dude, 
Some people really don't come to class. Did you know we had an Asian in our class? I chuckled and replied, Dude, it's crazy how people don't come to lectures. Let me just make it clear I'm not racist at all. She just stuck out like a sore thumb, being the only Asian in our class. We wrote our test and went home. A few days later, I was doing a psychology assignment and was stressed out of my mind. At the time, I was speaking to a guy that I'd only been on one date with. He seemed sweet, but when I told him that I wouldn't be on my phone for long because I needed to finish my assignment, he fought with me, saying he is more important than the assignment. I dealt with a lot to try and make a relationship work, including telling my best guy friend that I wouldn't be able to see him for a while because my new boyfriend didn't want me to have any guy friends. At this point, I thought I'd had enough and told him it was over and blocked him. As soon as I blocked him, my phone buzzed and my varsity group was going crazy with messages about the assignment. But then the strangest message came up. I'm selling a tarantula if anyone's interested. I responded with, what the hell are you doing with a tarantula? And I kid you not, this was the response. It's hot and creepy, but more creepy now, so I want to sell it. We decided to DM so that he wouldn't bother the rest of the group and began talking about all kinds of random topics. I look at the profile picture and it was a really attractive guy. So I thought to myself, why would someone name their son May? He was funny and pretty good looking. So I was happy to meet him the next day at Varsity. I arrived at Varsity and handed in my assignment and went to class. I walked into the lecture hall and found myself with my friends and chatted with them while waiting for class. As we were chatting, I messaged May and asked where he was. He said that he was coming and just running a bit late. I told him he'd better hurry because the lecturer had just walked in. The lecture begins and a few minutes later, I feel someone tap me on the shoulder. I turn around to see an average height Asian girl with glasses. What happened next blew me away. She holds out her hand and says, hi, I'm May. I look at her confused and introduce myself. Once the lesson was over, I asked her who her profile picture was, because it clearly wasn't of her. Turns out it was of her boyfriend at the time. And this was the start of our friendship. She's a crazy funny girl who is actually half Chinese and half Afrikaans. We always make dark or sexual jokes, and she's honestly one of the sweetest girls I know. We became really good friends, and when she mentions that she takes the train to Varsity, I offered to drive her because she lives so close. So now skip ahead a week. I arrive outside her driveway waiting to pick her up, and she's not ready, as usual. So I play some music, have a smoke, and just chill in the car until she's ready. I do this quite often, because May is always late, so this isn't new for me. I'm in the car waiting, and when I look to my right, I see a man about mid-forties wearing jeans, a black t-shirt, and a blue jacket. He's standing outside the driveway of the next door neighbor's house, so I assume he's there for the neighbors, and I go back to minding my own business. I look at my watch and the girl is still not here. Typical. I turn my head and see this guy now staring at me with a mouth open. It's rather creepy, but I let it go and get back to music. After another five minutes, I look again, and the man is still staring with his jaw dropped. Now I feel creeped out. I decide to roll out my window just in case. Keep in mind this is in Johannesburg, South Africa, and it's not the safest place to be, and this was a few weeks before my cousin was involved in a home invasion, and was beat and violated, so I was aware of what was going on around me. I am definitely not feeling comfortable, and now looking a third time the man was still staring, and did not move an inch. I decided to call it quits. So I phoned May and asked if she could please hurry and open her gate because there was a creepy guy outside. She let me in and her dad is actually angry that I was waiting outside to begin with, saying how unsafe it is. He's right. But to be fair, if May had been ready, I wouldn't have been waiting around. Anyway, we get in the car and open the gate and I'm relieved to see the man is gone. I have no idea what he's capable of. He may have been mentally ill or deciding if he was going to attack me. I'll never know. May joked about saying how he probably thought my car was sexy and was debating whether to bang it. So creepy old man, I hope 
we never meet again. I am a 17 year old junior, and all of my life I have never really had any creepy experiences from a total stranger. Well, that changed not long ago, during the second week of August. So every year my band goes to this college, and we spend a week there practicing the songs for the marching season. On the first day, I got to my school early in the morning with my brother to help load the truck with all the instruments. And after lunch, everyone in the band got on the bus and headed straight for the college. When we got to the college, we unloaded the truck and had dinner after that. Now my band has three long, boring practices each day and that's in the morning, afternoon, and evening. Then there is family night, where we play games with the seniors in my band and earn points, and the family with most points wins. You're probably wondering why the heck I'm giving you all this boring information about band. What does it have to do with a scary story? And what's the worst that can happen at band camp? For those of you who are in a band, wondering why. I'm giving you this information so that you understand because it is important. Anyway, enough about my band. Let me tell you what happened. So on the second day, I got up early to head over to the college gym, which has locker rooms, an indoor basketball court, and classrooms. All of the instruments are in gym, and they stay there when we are done practicing. I happen to be in the front of the ensemble, and this year, Instead of being a percussionist like I've always been, I'm a bells and chimes player instead. So front ensemble just stays by the gym where the colour guard does their morning exercises before disappearing for the next two hours to go somewhere else to practice the choreography for the show. After doing those boring exercises for the next hour, we practiced the song for a little bit and my instructor made all front ensemble go their separate ways to practice on our own. I went to this shade so that the chimes didn't heat up while I was practicing. I had already memorized the first movement of my part during band workshops, and I was pretty excited about getting my part for movement two on the show. Anyway, while I was practicing in the shade, I noticed these people in green shirts, and I assumed they were campus staff just cleaning up. One of the staff came up to me a few minutes after, and he told me that the bells had a set of beautiful sounds. I thanked him, and went back to practicing. Then a few minutes later, he came back a second time, and made another compliment with the bell set, and I thanked him again. When he came back a third and fourth time to compliment the chimes, I thanked him again. He then asked me, aren't I hot? No, no, it's not what you think. You see, I wore a sweater that day, and I could see why he was asking me that. I get it all the time. Why do I wear a sweater in 100 degrees in California weather? But that's a story for another time, on why I wear a sweater 24-7, and it's not scary related. So I told the guy, no, I'm not hot at all. I'm totally fine with wearing a sweater in hot weather. He let me be, and shaking my head, I went back to work on practicing. At the night practice, I noticed the guy again. In my head, I was like, oh, it's that guy from earlier that was complimenting the bell set. I saw him go right by on the field on a bike, and I didn't see him again. I shrugged my shoulders and thought nothing of it, and went back to playing with the band. The next morning, things got even weirder. I got my part for movement two on the show, and I was pretty excited about it. I happen to be one of those people who are fast learners, and can get a task done pretty quickly. The next morning, things got even weirder. I got my part for movement two of the show, and I was pretty excited about it. I happen to be one of those people who are fast learners, and can get a task done pretty quick. After doing those boring exercises like always, my instructor made us go our separate ways again, so that we could practice on our own. I went back to my usual spot, and got right to work on my new part. I saw the same guy from yesterday again, and thought, 
Oh, there's that guy again. That complimented the bell set. A few minutes later, he went up to me and started complimenting the bell set again. Then he all of a sudden started complimenting me, and how the part I am playing for bells looks pretty hard. And in my head, I had all these thoughts just coming in. Okay, why the hell is he complimenting me? Can't he compliment anyone else in the pit other than me? And why does he mean my part looks hard? He is the guy that looks like he has no experience with music whatsoever. But being the sweet girl that I am, I thanked him for his compliments and went right back to work. At some point, I ended up practicing in the sun because there were so many bugs against the wall in front of me and I can't stand bugs at all. A few minutes after practicing in the stupid sun and heat, as I'm still wearing my heavy sweatshirt, I got a little confused with my part and went to my instructor for help. After I got the help I needed, I made my way back to my spot. I checked my phone to see what time it was and how much time we had left before lunch. When I looked up, when I was a couple of feet away from the bell set, I saw the same guy again. And this time he was playing with my bell set. I just froze in place and had more thoughts circling my head. What is this guy doing playing the bell set without my permission? Why does he have such an interest in me? Why can't he talk to anyone else in the pit instead of going to me? This guy then notices me, and he puts the mallets I was using right where I had them before, and I went to go talk to my instructor. The guy just smiled at me, and told me that the bell set sounded beautiful, and he asked me if it was brand new. I told him it was, and that I got it before the season started. And then he started asking about the chimes, and I answered his stupid questions. He eventually left, and shaking my head, I thought it was nothing again, and went right back to work. During night practice, I saw the guy again, and this time he drove by on his bicycle, and I noticed that he had his phone up high as if he was recording something, and once again being gullible, I thought it was absolutely nothing. On the third day, this is when I really started to lose it. I got up and headed to the gym a little earlier than usual, and there were not that many people when I got there. The leader of my section, Amanda, was already there along with my friend, Kiana, who is now in the pit instead of the clarinet. And both of them were moving the pit instruments outside, and I helped them get the rest of the stuff out until everyone else came. After the usual boring exercises and warm-ups that my instructor made Front Ensemble do, he gets us to go our separate ways so that we can practice again on our own. I kept going inside many times to get a drink from the water fountain because I was so stupid that I left my water bottle at home, so that meant I had to go through the whole time just without a bottle of water. When I went there for the 15th time to get a drink and was cursing myself for being such a clueless, pathetic idiot, for leaving her water bottle at home and walking out of the front door without it. As soon as I got there, the guy came from yesterday and came up to me out of the blue and asked me, what size shirt are you? I was frozen in shock and I had no idea what to do. What? And he asked again, what size shirt are you? Still being in shock, I said, eh? He asked again. And then he asked me if I wanted a shirt, and seeing no way out of this situation, I said yes, and told him I was a size small. He went through this door that was by the water fountain and left. As soon as I got outside, in my head I was like, what the hell just happened? I felt sick, and went back inside again, but this time it was to use the restroom. I was in there for a long time, not only to do my business, but also to think about what just happened a few minutes ago. After I was done, someone just a few stalls down on my left flushed at the same time I did. I get a little creeped out and rushed from the stall, and as I was washing my hands from the mirror of the sink, I saw someone's feet from the other stall, and I realised I wasn't alone in the bathroom the entire time. When I dried my hands, the person stepped out of the stall. It was a lady who was wearing the same green shirt that the man was wearing, and by now I was freaking out, and I quickly rushed out the bathroom. 
while walking down the hallway. In my head, I had all these thoughts. Like, what the hell's going on? Why is all this stuff happening to me? Did I do something wrong just to end up in a situation like this? While I was having these thoughts, the man came out with a shirt and gave it to me. He told me he found a size small for me and that I can keep it and change out of my sweater because of how hot I looked with it on. Now, I happened to be great at acting for a band nerd. So I played the sweet girl character and acted all excited and happy and thanked him for the shirt. The shirt was for a track team at the college and it looked a little big on me, but it would do. He asked me if it was fine if he washed it for me, but I told him thank you no and that I'd wash it when I got home. He let me be and still with a super fake smile on my face, I walked outside and just stood there behind the bell set under the shade by the gym. I looked to my right to see my friend, Victoria, who was now in front ensemble instead of playing the baritone, helping the new girl, Natalie, practice the vibraphone. And then there's this girl, Kiana, who's practicing on the synth. I look to my left and see my instructor on his iPad mini looking at the music. And then there's Amanda and my other friend, Zach, practicing on the marimba. And then there is Winston, who was in the band in freshman year and left the band and then returned. I look behind me and I see Darren, who is also new to Front Ensemble, and he is talking to one of the staff I knew from freshman year. As soon as I was done looking around, I sat down and was just thinking about what to do with the shirt. I ended up leaving the shirt in the mallet bag and decided to deal with it later. After lunch, I was heading back to the gym for the afternoon practice, when all of a sudden, this voice in my head just yelled at me. Hold on a minute. You think everything is okay? Of course not. Do you realize what's going on? You're being stalked by some creepy guy who wouldn't leave you alone. Did you notice he didn't go to Victoria, Natalie or Kiana and compliment them? He's only going to you and only you and no one else. After hearing that, I immediately felt miserable and had a really sick feeling in my stomach and I just wanted to turn around and head straight back into my room and hide in the covers and never come out. But I still went to practice, and the whole time was feeling miserable. I just could not stop thinking about the man, the shirt, and what I had gotten myself into. After the practice was over, I just went to my room instead of the mess hall. I changed out my jeans, my disgusting sweaty sweatshirt, and sweaty t-shirt, and changed into my stay-at-home clothes which were my P uniform from freshman year. The entire time during the dinner break, I was sitting in my room eating all the snacks I bought from my house, and just sitting there on the bed in silence, thinking about what I'd gotten myself into. After dinner, I got changed and went back to the gym, with a feeling that I was ready to pass out any second. After moving all the stuff from the gym to the field for night practice, I needed to use the restroom. And I had a feeling that I was going to throw up, but I didn't. After I was done, I went back to the field and now everyone, including the colour guard, was already there just setting up. While I was still feeling miserable and thinking in my head what I should do, I saw my friend, Logan, who I trust a lot more than Victoria and I happened to have a secret crush on. I said hi, and that's when I got the idea of deciding to tell Logan about it. I stopped him and he asked me what was up. I told him that I needed to talk, and that it was pretty urgent, and if it would be okay to talk as soon as practice was over. He told me that he was fine with it, and that he would see me after. I thanked him, and went back to my spot. During night practice, I noticed the water guy who was wearing a green shirt as well, not the creepy guy, and he was right next to this red van, and there was someone in it but I couldn't see who it was. Now I was panicking like crazy, and I had all these ideas running in my head. I told myself to calm down, and just to keep an eye out on the water guy in the van. The water guy was just watching. He wasn't even doing anything other than talking to whoever was in the red van. He eventually got into his little golf cart, and left to do whatever he had to do. As soon as practice was over, I was still panicking on the inside and did my best to not start crying in front of everyone. After I got my belt set inside the gym, and Logan put away his bass drum, we both went into his room, and once we were inside, 
and in the living room, I told him the whole story of the creepy guy, and how he kept complimenting me on the bell set and not complimenting everyone else in the ensemble. And the shirt guy gave me a shirt, which I bought with me and showed him as proof, and that I didn't know what to do. After I told Logan the whole story, he told me that was creepy, and that the situation I am in sounded pretty serious. Definite stalking. He told me that I should tell my teacher, or even my instructor, so they would know what to do, and I wouldn't have to deal with the creeper guy alone. Logan thanked me for telling him, and that I shouldn't keep something like that to myself, especially if it was serious, and he asked me if I wanted him to be with me while I tell my teacher. I said yes. So after the band activity, I went to my teacher, and Logan was with me the whole time as I told the teacher the situation I was in and showed him the shirt. My teacher thanked me and told me that he'd keep an eye out for the guy so that he could talk to him. As Logan and I were leaving, I noticed that my teacher called Zach over. Logan told me that my teacher probably called Zach over so Zach could keep an eye on me for tomorrow if the creeper guy did come back in the morning. When I got to my room, I thanked Logan for walking me back and that I would see him in the morning. After we said goodnight, I immediately had a shower and changed into my PJs. And after a while, Victoria came over. And she told me that she noticed I was with Logan the whole time. And asked me what that was all about, since she sort of knew that I had a crush on him. Since I trusted Victoria, and I knew she wouldn't tell anyone, I told her the whole story the same way I told Logan. And showed her the shirt the guy gave me. After I was done telling her... She told me the same thing Logan told me, that I was in a serious situation and definitely had a stalker. She told me it was good that I told an adult about it instead of keeping it to myself, which I'm glad I didn't because it was eating me up on the inside. So to lift up my spirits, she invited me to the common room after call time and that she would be getting people after call time. After call time, I went to the common room with Victoria and her roommates, who I was also friends with, and Kiana. I had a fun time with the girls and my fellow bandmates, and after it was all over, I went straight to my room and got into bed, and cried myself to sleep big time. Next morning, I didn't want to go to practice, because I knew I would have to deal with the creepy guy again. After getting dressed and not eating breakfast, I met Logan by the elevator on the first floor because he didn't want me to walk to the gym alone, and we walked together there. Instead of doing the usual boring practices and warm-ups like always, everyone had to bring the front ensemble equipment to the field, so I was glad I didn't have to deal with the guy. The morning practice went well, and I forgot about the creepy guy until my teachers came to me after the practice was over. He told me that he talked to the guy I described to him last night, and he told me the guy was looking out for me because I was wearing a sweatshirt and he gave me a shirt so that I could change into it instead of wearing sweaty clothes. I thanked my teacher for telling me that and I moved the bell set to the truck with everyone else so we could load up and head back to my high school. It's been nearly a month and I'll never forget that moment in band camp and it wasn't the first time I've had a weird experience there. But that is a story for another time. The day before school started, I was hanging out with Logan at the park across from school, and he told me his roommate overheard our conversation from the night, and he told Logan that it was a good idea to tell an adult about the situation, and that he didn't tell anyone about what he had heard. Then when school started, I was talking to Victoria about the incident. She told me that she was sorry I had to go through all of that, and that I shouldn't deal with something like that ever. And even though it's been nearly a month, I still feel sick thinking about the incident. And I still have the goddamn shirt the guy gave me. And I plan on getting rid of it. Instead of wearing it. Because it would just make me feel worse. And I want to do whatever I can to forget it happened. So that's my story. And now if you excuse me, I have practice to go to. Take my advice. If you're ever in a situation where you can't get out of it like mine, don't be afraid to tell an adult or anyone else. And this is a message to the creepy guy at band camp. Let's not meet again.
Hey guys, it's Mort here, and thank you so much for listening. As you probably picked up, I do have a little bit of a cold. So I hope that didn't bother you guys. I did put a vote out, and you guys wanted stories, so I hope I delivered. If you enjoyed, please don't forget to drop the magical like and leave a comment with your thoughts, as it really helps and goes a long, long way. If you're new here, I don't often sound this ill, so stick around and subscribe and press the bell icon so that I can impress you on other days as I do post every night to make sure you have your nightly spooks. If there's a story that you wish to share, feel free to email it or post it to my Reddit page. Funnily enough, all these stories were submitted by awesome subscribers like you guys. So thank you. It was awesome sharing your experiences. But anyway, for now guys, I'm going to sign off. Stay awesome, and I'll see you in the next one.